and good morning, everybody. My name is Jesse. I'm here with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. And if you're new to us or coming in for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. Now, you're catching us on a very exciting day because today is day two of our epic series in partnership with the friends at If Then. If Then is an initiative of the Lydon Hill Philanthropies, and it is meant to showcase and celebrate the amazing diversity of women in STEM around the world. Now, every February since our inception, we have always spent the entire month in commemoration of the International Day for Women in STEM, doing solely amazing programs with women. 55, 60 broadcasts every single year, all free, live, and interactive. It's a ton of fun. Everything we do is on our YouTube channel if you want to catch it, catch it there. Now, as I said, we're continuing our series. Yesterday, we hung out with Sam Wins live at Carrillo National Monument. We hung out with Becca Pashoto talking about her job and the rising star cave going to look for past human origins. And today, we're kicking off with an entirely new topic, something that's fairly unique to us here at Exploring by the City of Your Pants, which is neuroscience. What's going on inside your brain? Now, there's no better guide to that than our speaker extraordinaire today, Dr. Tay. She is all over social media. She's got a fantastic website. If you want to find out what's going on inside your head, you can check out all her stuff at heydrtay.com, at heydrtay. Way more to discover than one broadcast can possibly fit in. But if you are here today, we're going to dive in together on a little journey. I can't wait for all your questions. But without further ado, thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Tay, and welcome to the broadcast for the first time. <laughs> Hi, Jesse. Hi, everyone. Thank you for allowing me to be here. I think this is a wonderful opportunity. I've seen some of your previous videos, so I love how enthusiastic the students are about STEM. That was something that was very uncommon when I was growing up, so I love that. It is such a great era for science communication. I think when I grew up, there was so little, there were like a few people in fits and starts. And now there's so many incredible advocates for any number of scientific fields that are so passionate and dedicated. And frankly, that's why we have you on today. So if you want to dive in with all your stuff, please feel free to bring it up and uh, we'll go on a little journey inside the mind together. Absolutely. So the first thing I always preface everyone by saying or something about myself is I don't like to be bored. And when I was growing up and in classes, you would literally lose me in your class if it was too many slides, not enough pictures, not enough engagement or interaction. Um, so there are per parts of my presentations that's going to do just that. Make sure that we stay entertained, but also completely involved in what I'm trying to tell you about a neuroscience career, my journey in particular. So as Jesse did introduce me, I am a neuroscientist. My name is Dr. Latasia Jones, but I also have a brand called Hey Dr. Tay, which can be found on any social media platform, as well as the website, heydrtay.com. And what I love for the students to do is always, at least if you don't remember Dr. Latasia Jones, if you don't remember Latasia, and if you don't remember Jones, it's easier to remember Hey Dr. Tay. So that's why I created that brand the way I did. So getting straight into it, a little bit about myself. So I am a scientist, I am a STEM educator, and I am a role model. But what does this really mean when you look at that? I have a background in molecular biology with a specialty in neuroscience. And my main focus on in, within my research was to advance biomedical sciences. And for those of you who you're like, these are big words, I have no idea, idea what you're saying. Molecular biology is looking at the more molecular side of your, your body or just biology itself. That can include proteins and so on, right? And neuroscience, we'll get more into this later, but it's the study of the brain. So I do have today my little brain model to show, you know, just how intricate the brain can be, right? Um, there's different colors to show different regions, but on the inside, there's so many areas that you cannot get into unless you go past that superficial layer. So that's why neuroscience is so complex and challenging, but also so exciting because there's so many things you can get into and so many questions that can be asked along the way. I am also a STEM educator. And what does that mean? I create STEM initiatives. I like to show excitement, my excitement for STEM to other students uh, because I do believe that everyone is constantly learning. No matter if you're in a classroom or outside of a classroom, there's something to learn in every environment that you're in. So I, I love to create little programs, doing live experiments, and even things like this, which is talking about my journey and showing some examples of neuroscience to students so you all can learn and hopefully be motivated through my story. 
And then last but definitely not least, I am a role model. So I love sharing my STEM journey, providing guidance and advice to students who are thinking about neuroscience in the future or any type of STEM career. And most importantly, I advocate for diversity in STEM. And this is essentially me saying, I want st the STEM workplace, the STEM education programs and academic programs to be so open and inviting to everyone. So everyone in your class should be able to be able to sit in any of these careers without thinking about why they're the only person in the room or why somebody doesn't like them because of how they look and how what they can present to the table, culturally, background and intellectually to that space. I want it to be so open and inviting that everybody's in, invited to that, that room in that space. So it's kind of like going to a cookout or a party. You always want an invitation, right? So I want STEM to be this invitation that goes out to everyone. So there's so much more that I want to get into about neuroscience. But before I get there, I want to talk a little bit about my journey. So for those of you who are in classrooms, I do not want to discourage you. But in total, it took me 11 years to finally start my research in a research lab. But fortunate for me, I started research very young as a freshman in college. So I did the middle school, I did the high school, and then I went to college. And I, I would be remiss if I skip over this because especially some of you out there, you're probably in middle school right now. I found my love for science when I was thinking that I was gonna actually be a basketball star. So I was playing on a basketball team in my middle school years. And my mom said, you're, you, know, you have to refocus on your science. I started getting progress reports and report cards that said I talked too much in my science class. And she threatened me. She said, if you continue to talk too much in your science class, I'm taking you off the basketball team. And at that time, I was like so in love with basketball that if you, would, if you said or anything against me playing on that team, I would do whatever you needed me to do to get to stay and remain on the team. But for some reason, you know, as a teenager, I was a little rebellious. So I didn't listen to my mom. And lo and behold, she did what she said she would do. She took me off of the basketball team. and. I'm kind of grateful this day for her taking me off the team because it allowed me to explore other things because I think I was so focused on being an athlete that I forgot there are other things that I'm so young that I could actually explore at that time. And it allowed me to refocus on science. And I fell in love with, I think at the time it was my env environmental science class. And then that stemmed into the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And especially like anatomy class and doing dissections and so on in the labs. It created this motivation for me to keep moving towards science. So in 20, 2006, I started my bachelor's at Virginia State University, which is an HBCU or historically black college university in Virginia. I found this amazing opportunity to work within a laboratory setting that you see in the middle here um, with Dr. Diane Shakes. And this was, this was the first time I had ever met a female who owned a lab. So I was so excited by the fact of just being in a laboratory for the first time. But on top of it, having a female leading the lab who was doing the firing, the hiring, and she was an expert in the field. Um, this really set me towards a career in science because originally I thought I was going to go pre-med route and become a medical doctor and use biology as the discipline that I followed. But once I was in that lab, I said, no, I wanna be a scientist. This is the most amazing thing I could ever do. I have to stay in this space. So I, years down the lane, I decided to pursue my PhD, which is equivalent to a medical doctor, but more on the intellectual basis or knowledge basis, where originally the people who are writing the articles, writing up our findings after research, and putting it out into the universe so that way the treatments, the cures, the diagnoses could be created based on the information that we're finding. Um, I was the first African-American to graduate from the Department of Biomedical Sciences at Florida State University in 2017. I then went on to continue to work within the lab and now I'm here at NIH as a scientific review officer. So I'm gonna go in more details about that, but I do wanna, to kind of emphasize that scientists can exist in a lot of different spaces. So as I talked about it, I talked about me being in a laboratory and then ending up in what now is like a, a desk job, right? Like I'm behind a computer and I'm doing, still using my neuroscience background while being behind the computer. But we'll talk about that more in detail later. Before I get to 
fast into everything else. I want to really hone in on what exactly is a neuroscientist, because that's essentially what you all came to hear about. What, right? Like, what does a neuroscientist do? do? So a neuroscientist studies the brain. They answer questions regarding the brain and certain neurological disorders. So if you've ever heard of like ADHD, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, um, autism, and so many other things, uh, these are neurological disorders that affect the brain or stem from the brain. And that's the reasoning and the source to why that disease exists. So it's my job as a neuroscientist to go within the lab and to figure out ways to answer questions involving those diseases and try to get those questions out into the world so that those answers out into the world so that way we can better advance the biomedical science field. So biomedical science in particular is using biomedicine or biology and the understanding of bio, biology to advance medicine. So you can't have one with the, without the other, right? And I think a lot of times we don't really understand this, but medical doctors and PhD doctors rely on each other. We do a lot of research on the PhD side and advance what we know when it comes to diseases and essentially create treatments and, and diagnoses and, and therapeutics, whether it's the medicine that you may take or know of or so on. And the medical doctors make sure that they administer based on a diagnosis or what they see was going on with their patients. So we work hand in hand in a lot of ways. So as I stated earlier, where else can a scientist work? And I know I've seen some of the presentations that you've had before and sat in on before, but I'm going to ask you this question later. So I really want you to be thinking about this as I go through the presentation. My big question in my research is how abnormalities within certain regions of the brain and the development of a child could create psychiatric disorders. In particular, I'm looking at the corpus callosum, its development in a child, and how abnormalities in the corpus callosum are associated with autism. So a typical day at my job involves vigorous research, looking at articles of past research that's already developed and experiments that have already taken place. I'm looking at a, a question that hasn't been answered. So other scientists and looking at their articles that they've already written or their manuscripts allow me to fine tune the experiments that I am trying to push through or trying to troubleshoot in order for me to answer the question that I am posing when it comes to research. So that was just a so that was just a quick video of, you know, the neuroscience and what it looks like on a daily day within a neuroscience laboratory setting. And as I stated in the video, there are times where I'm reading over articles and manuscripts from other scientists. There are times where I'm literally doing hands-on stuff within the lab, um, or I could be doing data analysis on a computer. You saw some images of me looking at a microscope. So neuroscientists can really exist in a lot of different spaces. It really depends on the questions being asked and how they're going to answer those questions. So before I go too far, I just want to give you an idea of just how big and important neuroscience is, right? And a lot of times, I think when I talk to students, the things that we all think about, we don't really associate neuroscience or how your brain interacts with those ideas. So I want to give you a quick example or two. So if, if anyone has Instagram, Facebook, or TikTok, right, and you're strolling down your timeline and you see certain images, certain videos, there are different emotions evoked by those images and videos. So for example, if you're a gamer, maybe you see a game being played and, uh, or you see somebody has won a game or they're just, you're watching one of the YouTube videos of a video game being played, you may get upset for somebody losing or you may get excited about the game altogether. Uh, if anybody's a Taylor Swift fan or a Rihanna fan, sometimes just seeing like their love story and how they support each other, it makes you feel like this emotional love, you know, feeling within, right? And a lot of times, I wanna make sure I emphasize that since today is the day before Valentine's Day. So it's very important to kind of talk about love since nationally in the US, we celebrate Valentine's Day tomorrow, right? 
Um, and then if I see a video of Beyonce, I'm going to get excited, right? I'm going to be excited about her music. I'm going to sing along. I'm going to dance with her because to me, she's one of the best R&B, uh, hip hop and pop artists of today. But if I see these pictures of these adorable uh, cats and dogs sitting inside these, <laughs> these clothes hung up on a clothesline, I'm like, oh, that's my first reaction, right? So altogether, I probably went through a, at least five different emotional reactions just by seeing five different pictures on this screen. Imagine going down a, a timeline and you're seeing about 20 in maybe one minute, right? You're going to have a lot more emotional spikes going on. And that's very important to think about on the neuroscience side, because every time you have emotions, you have essentially those neurons spiking off and they're being excited or they're being they're expressing that emotion to the right regions of the of the brain. So, I really like to talk about in particular anger, right? Because a lot of times a lot of times when we go to talk to students or even just being on a daily day, daily day just trying to go to work or going to your to your school, there's something that upsets upsets you, right? Like you can get upset just from leaving the house or something that happened in the house. You get upset when you go back home, you could get upset while, upset while in the actual school. So what really happens when you're angry and how does being angry affect your brain? So originally when you're angry, this first spark activates the amygdala, which is this region right here in the brain. After it's activated, that activates the hypothalamus, right? The important thing that I want to make mention of is when that activation of the amygdala occurs, it's before you even realize you're angry. So just the thought of, oh my gosh, I lost the, the football game or I lost the basketball game. I can't believe that just happened. And I don't feel like the referee was on my side, but they did me an injustice, right? I'm angry now, but I don't realize I'm angry. I'm just really thinking through what's going on about losing the basketball game. So that spike originally goes to the amygdala, which then goes towards the hypothalamus. These are regions in the brain. Once in the hypothalamus, the hypothalamus then releases a hormone called corticotrophic, right? That then releases more hormones in the pituitary gland. And that essentially affects the adrenal glands, which produces more hormones Hormones for the sake of not going into many details. I want to talk about a little bit about cortisol, adrenaline, and neuroadrenaline, which are very important for your expression of fear, aggression, your upset, and so on. But more importantly, how does this affect your body? And I think this is the reason why I want to emphasize this, because although sometimes we don't realize we're angry. There's so many things happening once you are angry and when you're in the midst of your upset. So think about the time, the last time you were angry. Maybe somebody shut your video game off in the midst of you playing, or maybe you fell in front of people and they laughed, or um, you got a bad grade in a class or something, right? Uh, think about that anger and how that made you feel. Well, when you're angry, this affects your stress levels in your body. And when your stress levels are affected, it essentially messes up how your prefrontal cortex and hippocampus function. And if they don't function properly and these stress hormones are increased, there's a lot of things that can happen to your body along the way. So I know for a lot of the older generation, we think about like our grandparents and our parents and their high, they get high blood pressure, their heart rate goes up and so on. But these are a lot of things that are affecting more kids now these days than it has before. And I think it's really associated with our sometimes just our mood and our behavior and our inability to deal with our anger, anger properly. So when you think about this, if you're riding a bike and you're very angry versus when you're riding a bike and you're not angry, there's a different level of efficiency in riding your bike. So you may be able to ride in a straight line very easily without as much effort and brain power if you're not angry. But if you're extremely angry, this messes up your ability to steer properly and to think ahead, right? So maybe you're riding down the sidewalk on your bike or you're riding close to the street on your bike and you're angry. So you may not see a car coming or you may not see the rock in the middle that's going to create a big 
uh, jump in your 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 bike wheel, right? These are things that are affected by the fact that you're so angry that this is messing up your ability to think properly without that blurriness and that haze in your ability to process what's going on. So the overall goal of showing these slides are to kind of emphasize, hey, if you're angry, let's find some healthy ways to balance that out, right? So what are some healthy ways that Dr. Tay manages to hone in and, and, and manage that beast within. And I call it the beast within because a lot of times you get so angry, you don't even be, you're not even yourself anymore, right? So one thing that I like to do is I like to sing and dance and I'm very goofy, which you know a lot of people don't know. Scientists have other types of personalities involved in one, right? Like they're not just nerds or just in a lab doing science and researching science stuff, but they're also like a whole human. And a lot of times people don't realize that when they talk to Dr. Tay. So I like to bring these things out about myself in creative ways like this. So I love singing and I love dancing. I like to like, you know, watch little, I love Marvel and <laughs> watching movies is like one of my favorite things to do, especially with a good uh, bowl of popcorn and a nice drink on the side. I love watching great films, great entertainment, um, especially comedies. I really love comedies because I love to laugh. Um, and then my least favorite thing to do, but it feels satisfying at the end, I love working out. Uh, working out does alleviate a lot of that stress. And it has been shown scientifically that the more you work out and the more you do the things that you that brings you joy, it levels out or balances your anger and hopefully flattens and diminishes it as well, right? So we want to make sure that we are really managing the beast within and eliminating all that anger because once again, with the anger built up, you're messing up a lot of other things internally with whether it's anatomically things within your body, physiologically, or even just your ability to think properly moving forward. So we want to have our clear minds when you go into your classroom and you're about to take your quiz or your test, or even just presenting yourself to your teacher, you want to make sure your mind is at a clean slate so you could be the best student once entering that door. So before I leave you all, I do want to make mention, I know Jesse did mention this, that I said earlier before, I'm not just a scientist, but I also, I, I'm a role model. So the AAAS If Then Ambassador Programs is an amazing program that I am a part of and all the other amazing women that you're going to meet or have already met this month. And there's about 140 plus of us all in extraordinary STEM careers. So I think my career is amazing, right? And I love studying the brain because who doesn't like studying the brain or thinking about the brain in so many ways? But there are amazing, uh, like other amazing scientists and technologists and engineers and mathematicians within the ambassador program. I've, I've met shark scientists, bear scientists. Um, oh, one of the ambassadors works at NFL and does like data analytics. Is another one that used to work for Spotify in the background doing data analytics. So I think it's amazing to see all these STEM careers in different spaces. So the reason or the purpose of the ambassadorship is to advance women in STEM by empowering current innovators and inspiring the next generation. So that's why it's always my goal during these presentations to tell you all a little bit about my story hopefully be, make you a little bit more motivated to look into what the brain does and hopefully study that in the future. But most importantly, I want to talk about how in different ways we're able to serve as role models. So I do show some pictures here of, of different interactions that the role models and myself included has had with the, in, the other communities, right? Uh, we do a lot of hands-on activities with the kids in a lot of different spaces. We utilize stuff like Disney to kind of do a twist and allow you to explore STEM careers using Disney characters. So in the picture on the top in the middle, I am impersonating Snow White. But in this storyline, I am Snow White, the neuroscientist who finds a way to get um, you know, myself out of being in that, that slumber and that sleep after eating that rotten apple. Um, then you have some of my favorite ambassadors who are authors and they write children's books exploring STEM. Um, but some more exciting things like Sam Wins, she probably talked about Comic-Con. We went to San Diego and we all dressed up as action heroes or supervillains. 
um, <laughs> and allowed that to be our part of our story when talking about our STEM superpowers. Um, two of the last things that I want to make mention of is being able to learn how to fly a plane because a lot of times we don't think about the fact that STEM is involved in so many different areas. So while in San Diego for Sam Wins Comic-Con um, sessions, I had this amazing opportunity to, to learn how to fly a plane with Flex Air, which is this company that does piloting license, piloting um, classes and certifications. And they allowed me to have this amazing opportunity to take my fir first flight lesson in the sky. I think it was like, 3,500 feet above houses. And it allowed they allowed you to kind of learn how to do it. And they even let me take the wheel to steer this plane above the above ground, so high up. It was so amazing. I was able to look at the clouds, but I felt like I was actually in clouds at the same time. So it was exciting throughout the whole time. And last but definitely not least, we all have these full-blown statues, right? And they are... As you can see from my image here, I want to show you my mini statue. Um, we all have statues that essentially is a part of this traveling statue exhibit. And this traveling statue exhibit is unlike any other statue exhibit that you'll ever visit because one, it was the first time having that many statues representing women in STEM or just women, period, in statue form. The other thing is every time the statue exhibit went from one location to the next, all of those ambassadors, if not the majority of them, traveled to that exhibit as well. So you people had the chance of walking into the exhibit, seeing a statue and talking to the person that the statue was representing a little bit to learn a little bit more about their career and about their journey and everything that they're trying to do. So this is just a you know, many statues showing, you know, exactly what it looks like in person. But of course, it's not, I'm not this height. So <laughs> the ones that are in person are actually, <laughs> the ones that are in person are actually five, mine is like five, eight, five, nine, because that's my actual height. So just wanted to show that to show you one of the most extraordinary parts of this program and how mentorship and being a role model has gone way above you know, the average things that we have thought about in past when it comes to teaching and talking about our STEM journey. And the last thing that I wanted to make mention of is because of this ambassador program, I started a brand called Hey Dr. Tay. And Hey Dr. Tay is my one of my most favorite things to ever, 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 ever do, which is to bring the excitement of STEM to students across the world. And I can do this on virtual platforms. I love to do it in person because you get that interaction with the students. And essentially what I do is I create little hands-on experiments that you can usually find the household items to pull together to do these experiments with. And we explore STEM topics such as like exothermic reactions, which you see the image here is me showing how in this experiment, heat is released in the version of either smoke or it travels in energy through the suds that you see in this small, small cup here, which shows you that the energy is being released in suds, but there's so much energy in this one that doesn't have any suds, if you see the cup on the further end, that it has to be released in the form of smoke or heat. Um, and this is ex essentially what an exothermic reaction is. It's the release of thermal energy or heat in this case. So I love doing things like that. I hope to continue to do things like that. But this is one of the most favorite things that I like to do as a scientist now in my stage in my career. So without further ado, I just definitely want to say thank you all again for being here. And I know Jesse's going to take over and give you some question and answers. But I did want to provide my QR scan for the teachers and for the students. Because, um, hey, Dr. Tay can be found on all types of social media platforms. <laughs> I'm not sure if the students can have their, their phones in class. <laughs> but if the teachers want to take this down as a resource, it does connect them to a lot of the live experiments I do that I've posted on YouTube, as well as me flying the plane, which is on my Instagram and Facebook, and uh, the interviews that I do with other STEM, STEM ambassadors and STEM mentors across the world. 
So thank you so much again. And I will stop sharing. So thank you so much for one thing. I checked out the amazing video you flying, by the way, on Instagram. And oh. everyone can go watch that when they're done. It's so cool. You are awesome. Um, thank you. Uh, <laughs> on the science note experiment, I will make sure that all our registered classes have this link, whether you're in Georgia, Nova Scotia, Ontario, like our whole gang today is going to get this and everything about Dr. Tay. So lots of room to follow up when we're done. I'm so glad you mentioned live science experiments. We did live on a broadcast like last week, uh, Elephant Toothpaste, which is one of the most accessible ah! easy experiments. It's so much fun. No matter what grade you're in, you can do it with your teacher. So look yes. up Elephant Toothpaste and try and do that. And I'm sure... You've got some things on that as well, which is very Yeah, exciting. so, and I love elephant toothpaste. The pictures that I showed everyone was like the more extreme version of elephant toothpaste because as a scientist in the lab, we use more concentrated items. So elephant toothpaste uses hydrogen peroxide. I, I think it's like at 8% or something. Yep. Um, the hydrogen peroxide I use in the experiments that are only demonstrations, by the way, because it's dangerous for the kids, is at 30%. And it's dangerous because it starts to kind of like erode your skin. Burn. It'll literally burn you as you touch it. And um, not saying I know from experience, but I know from experience from being in a laboratory setting and not putting on gloves that it can burn your skin. So it's why it's very important to not give that to the students. So that's why I only showed fit. Uh, photos here. <laughs> well, this is the thing too, is as students, like make sure you have a parent or teacher there, but do science yes. with them. Like do these experiments. It's a lot of fun. Sometimes you want a trained professional like Dr. Tay doing these things in advance, but uh, if you get the chance to do them, it was a huge part of my scientific education and I'm sure you'll find it very, very inspiring. Now, yes. we're going to go to Q&A in just a minute. Mr. Mitchell's class, I am coming to you and I hope the mic works. Worst case, you can share in the chat. YouTubers, feel free to chime in as well. And Ms. Clark, please do dive in uh, whatever you guys want to share we'd love to take it over the next 10 minutes but i want to harp on something from the beginning of your talk very quickly because you highlighted this education journey of yours and how long mm -hmm. it took from ending high school and i remember being in grade five grade six the age of some of our classes today and that sounds really daunting it sounds so scary to spend that long in school but i mean honestly kids agree with me or not but like i like you get this amazing career. You get to do exactly what you love. You get to work with incredible people. You're like wildly happy about the stuff that you get to do. And there's not many people with careers that get to say that. So you spend this time in school and it seems like a lot, but at the end of it, you get your dream job for the rest of your life. And exactly. I, cool. I think it's pretty cool too. Um, I'm glad that it worked out for me. I do know there's a lot of people who don't want to spend that much time in school, right? And there, there are several paths you can go in. and a lot of people don't know, you can be a scientist without the PhD. It's just the PhD that determines your independence in science, which means having your own lab, getting your own funding, hiring and firing and so on. But you could be a scientist, like when I started in the research lab as a freshman and working at another school in their lab and learning how to do the science of their research, I was technically already a scientist, right? Because I was answering questions. I was proposing new questions. I was doing troubleshooting to figure out the best experiments and designing my, my research in order to answer those questions. So that's what essentially makes a scientist, not a degree, not schooling and so on, but being in the space where you can answer questions to help advance or the progress of biomedicine or just humans and, and animals and their livelihoods. The thing that we keep coming back to in this If Then series is the importance of being curious. And so whether you become a scientist or just like science, like just follow your passion, be excited about things, learn more, get a book, watch a movie, whatever you can do to keep the learning going is really important. I'm so glad you touched upon that as well. well yes, agreed. <laughs> I don't want to keep talking. I'm going to go to Mr. Mitchell's class joining us in lovely Savannah. If you guys want to come on in, we'll see if the mic works. Let's check. Hello. Hi. It works. Can you hear us? Yes, we can. Hi, guys. <laughs> All right. Does it, anybody Any questions? Have a question? You have a question? Anybody have a question? Uh, I, I have a question. Please. Sure. What, what are, can you go back over some of, well, I guess it's not a question, some of the uh, careers that you mentioned in uh, STEM? that you were talking about earlier? Yeah, thanks. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So there's a lot of different careers in STEM. So the first people that come up in mind, of course I talked about neuroscience career, but my sister, she works in cyber, cyber um, as a cyber analyst. So she does like looking to make sure there's no um, cyber threats, which could be a lot of different things, right? You could work for a company to make sure no one's trying to tap into the company's emails or so on. I have a friend that does computer engineering. 
Um, a few friends that do data analysis, I think I made mention of the friend that works at NFL looking at the sports stats. Um, I have another friend who worked at Spotify looking at who was listening to what music in the background. So they're doing a data analysis of music being listened to as many times you tap on that listen button or play button on the Spotify app. They were essentially getting that data back to kind of record that. Um, the If Then collection also includes people who are shark scientists, bear scientists. Yes. Um, there's a few more neuroscientists that are a part of the initiative and so on. And then I know you learned about archaeologists and paleontologists and so on. Yeah. We got an archaeologist yesterday. We've got a neuroscientist coming tomorrow again. Later today, we've got a coder coming in about 20 mm -hmm. minutes, actually. And then later, yes. we've got a deep sea scientist who goes and explores the deep sea with submersibles, which is very cool. And one thing I like to harp on, too, and I've been highlighting in these presentations is maybe you don't want to become a scientist, but you want to be in a scientific realm. You can mm -hmm. do that. If you're in, want to be a neuroscientist, there's law jobs, there's business jobs, yeah. there's accounting, there's cooks on board deep sea vessels, photographers. Like, I mean, you can be fascinated by this stuff and not want to pursue quite the career that Dr. Tay has done, but right. still be involved in a really meaningful way. And I mean, as a scientist by background, too, it's pretty cool. Like, we get to do some really amazing stuff and talk about these and share them with you. But uh, there's a wide variety of careers out there, and I'm really glad we got that question. So thank you, Mr. Mitchell. Yes. I will come back in a minute if you guys do think of a question. Any of our students there, please feel free. We've got another eight minutes or so together. Um, before I do, I wanted to share, you talked about some of the challenges of social media, and I'm really curious for our Gen Z generation that are coming up, and social media is just a big part of their lives. Is there any tips you'd recommend to students who might be spending too much time on social media? What is some of the <laughs> I can have. This is a big query, but I wanted to see if we could cover it today. Yes. And you're going to make people not like me before I leave. But, you know, the biggest tip is always to take a break from social media. And I know no one wants to hear that because we love to see the, most, the next trend on TikTok. Uh, what's the next dance that we should be learning or a song that we should be hearing? Or what is Taylor Swift doing today with her boyfriend? Right. Um, <laughs> there's so many things that people want want to tap into and to keep up with, but essentially taking a break and even just realizing that this is not the reality sometimes of what's being portrayed in these videos and these images, right? A lot of times people only post what you want them to see. Um, it's, they could be dancing today in this mansion, but really live down the street um, in a house that their mom is still paying for. So it's technically they don't, they don't own it, right? Um, or they could be telling you how uh, like exciting their influencer life is, but really they're not making money or anything. And once again, still living with mom at the house. So you, it really depends on what is being accurately portrayed. And we don't want to get caught up into that too much because it does influence how you think. And I've talked about the emotional side of it, but when it starts influencing your behavior, that's where it becomes more detrimental or, or more risky, right? Um, you just don't want to be in a situation where you're influenced to be more upset, more sad about your own current condition. We're all where we're supposed to be for a reason. Yep. And I think sometimes social media makes you feel like you're not where you're supposed to be. Do not allow that to happen. Take a break, breather, turn it off, go outside and play for a second, and then come back to it later. I'm not saying get rid of it because there's a lot of great benefits to social media. For instance, hey, Dr. Tay is on social media. So a lot of you would not, you know, learn some of the things that hey, Dr. Tay is able to kind of explain without going to social media. So I'm not saying get rid of it immediately. And I'm never for getting rid of social media because now that is one of the number one ways of teaching. It's just be careful about what energy or what your fuel is coming off of, like how much you're invested in and what you're looking at. Yeah, that's a beautiful way of, that's a that's fantastic and a lot of nuance in that. So thank you very <laughs> much for that. Truly, it's not real life. It's a way of showcasing things and stories just like television is, just like books are, just like news is, that can have a little bit of a slant. So make sure that you just get time off when you need it. Great point. Right. Thank you, Dr. Tay. We're going to take one more question. Time flies and you're having fun in these broadcasts. Before I head back <laughs> to the Michael's class, I want to note again, if you want to check out more of Dr. Tay's stuff, it's all online. I'm going to link this into all our registered classes if then she can.org all the amazing if then ambassadors resources all those statues you can learn more about all the people we're featuring during our if then series so much more to discover and you can share this program with your family and friends on our youtube channel so please do because the more people find out about all this stuff the better but we're gonna have back savannah if you want to come on back in to wrap us up you are good to go hey guys 
Hi. 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 When you went, was it hot? Was it tiring when you went to college and when you went to all of those different places? I love it. I think that is a that is a great, 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 great question. Yes, everything that you do is tiring, though, right? Like over time, things can get tiring. You have to take a break from it. Same way I take a break from social media is the same way as sometimes I have to take a break from neuroscience. And whether it's neuroscience learning or talking about it, after I give this presentation to you today, I'm probably going to take a 30 minute breather before I go to the next thing, right? Um, but I will say this. Neuroscience was the thing that kept me excited. So that was the reason why I kept moving towards it no matter what the challenge was. I, I talked to you all about being the first African-American, being the first Black person to earn my PhD in the Department of Biomedical Sciences at Florida State. It could have been the challenge, that could have been the challenge that said, you know what, I'm tired of this. I, I'm going to move away from it completely. But science kept me there. Being so excited about science, knowing that one day I'd be able to talk to the students more about what I do, um, being able to make, I, back then I made an antibody for a disease. So I helped a family understand a movement disorder that was messing up their, that was interacting, associated with their kids and being their kids that they were giving birth to. I was able to help biomedicine, right? And all these things continue to make me say, I want to stay here, regardless of what's going on, no matter how hard it is, no matter how tired it is, because sometimes I had to get up and be in the lab at four or five in the morning, or I wouldn't leave until 11 p.m., midnight. You know, it does get tiring, but because it's so exciting and because I know the impact of my work, I continue to go there. And I think once you all find out what you're really interested in, write it down, remember it so you can keep doing those things and figure out what career you want to be in. Because if you're going to spend all those hours doing something to pay your bills, it has to be something you're excited about because that's what's going to keep you waking up in the morning and staying there late at night. Dr. Tay, there is no better message than that. Thank you so, so much for joining <laughs> us today. Your passion, enthusiasm, knowledge are incredible. Um, I hope all our kids take the chance to check out all the amazing work that you do online uh, when they're done this broadcast. But I just want to say a big thank you for being part of our Epic If Then series. And uh, as we do to wrap up every program, I'm going to bring in Mr. Mitchell's class and say thank you and farewell. If you're on YouTube and you want to scream and yell at home as well, please do. <laughs> thank you so much, everybody. Have a 